Hello and welcome to Dogs with Torches. In this episode, we are joined once again with Dr. Gavin Kerr to discuss Thomas Aquinas's third way of the, of the five ways. Gavin, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Um, I've literally just taught a couple of hours of classes and then we just did a postgraduate seminar. We did. Yeah, yeah. that was, that was yeah. insane. And, and, and uh, what have you been up to lately? As I understand, you're, the, the last week was quite eventful for you and this upcoming <laughs> Sunday is also very eventful. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So um, the last week, uh, if any of the gentle listeners you know aren't aware, I delivered one of the plenary addresses to the American Catholic Philosophical Association annual conference in New Orleans, Louisiana. So I flew out to uh, New Orleans with my wife um, on, it was, I think, the, the Tuesday of last week, or the week before, sorry. Uh, we, flew, we flew out to New Orleans and um, 24 hours of travel. Uh, we, we, we got to New Orleans late that night um, by my watch. You know, uh, my, my, my alarm clock for the next day for 4.30 the next day went off. Right, you know, right. And we were just getting there, so it was 24 hours of travel. And uh, so we were at, uh, we were in New Orleans for the uh, ACPA conference, met a ton of really great people, some of whom you've had on your show. And uh, I delivered a plenary address on the Saturday, um, defending survivalism uh, against corruptionism within the thought of Thomas Aquinas. Uh, I did so in a Sons of Anarchy t-shirt. Yeah. Jeans. Yeah, yeah, DMs. Yeah. And, uh, and the video is on uh, YouTube uh, at the minute, uh, if anybody wants to check it out. But um yeah, it was a great, great day, great session, great experience. And uh, so re- really enjoyed the conference and really enjoyed, you know, meeting all these people that I just knew through through Facebook, uh, who all seemed to know me right. as well. Uh, although I think some of them were a wee bit surprised when they saw me. They may not have known that I was as, right. you know, scruffy looking and, you know, as uh, unprofessional looking. Right, right. Yeah. So, but that, that's what it, that's what I did uh, last week. And I just, I just returned last week and, um, Every day has just been melting into every other day, you know, catching up on right. my sleep and getting over the jet lag and stuff. And then as I understand it, uh, next Sunday, you've also got a big uh, event that's going to be happening pretty soon. Yes, on Sunday the 4th. Um, so I don't know when this is going to go out. So this could be going out after Sunday the 4th. But on Sunday the 4th, I'm taking part in another novice MMA uh, fight at, uh, at an event here in Ireland called Clan Wars. And Clan Wars draws uh, MMA fighters uh, from all over the country, and we have novice, amateur, and professional uh, fights at it. So I'm going to be fighting at Clan Wars. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm fighting at 75 kilos. It's my second sort of public MMA fight. You may obviously have done a lot of sparring and a lot of fighting. And in the very cage that I'm going to be fighting in on Sunday, it's at, it's at our gym that we train at, so I fought in that very cage as well. Uh, but that's what I'm going to be doing this Sunday. Three two-minute rounds, full MMA uh, although novice rules, so we're not allowed to grind and pound. Um, I'm not allowed to sit on his chest and start punching him right. in the face and right. all that. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, uh, doing that again. So uh, yeah, and you're going to it, Hunter, I'm, aren't you? I'm really excited to, to go see that. I've not, I, I, I've been to Belfast only once before, but this is the first time that that that, that, I'll, that I'll be staying there for for a few days. And uh, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to it. Is this your first MMA sort of event? It is, yes. I know that I, I've I, I've seen you post it over Facebook, and that was a lot of fun to watch. But I think like watching it in person is going to be going to be kind of insane. I'm yeah. excited. It's going to be great to watch all the fights. I mean, there's a lot yeah. of fights that day. It's going to be great to see the different styles of martial arts and the uh, the brotherhood and the fraternity. Mm. that develops um out of it you know that we're, we're all testing each other on our skills and right and right trying to hurt each other but not really hurt yeah. each other but to sort of you know rub our opponents out you know by using our skills that's that's what we're trying to do and um just to make us all better martial artists and uh, i mean this is something that we can discuss in a different podcast make us better martial artists and in my mind better people mm. as well by making us i i feel people that you know do martial arts are doing something which helps make them even more fully authentically human right so but we don't need to get into that today right right no yeah yeah definitely stay on topic but we should but that definitely would make for a good episode in in the future about like the, the philosophy of, of martial arts yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. yeah so right now I, I figured though that for this episode we discuss thomas aquinas's third way uh and and i figured mm-hmm. maybe we just start off with a general question what are mm-hmm. some what is the third way and and and, mm-hmm. and what are some sort of initial misconceptions that readers might have when they first encounter the the third way yeah so um the third way so uh i'm imagining your listeners will know that aquinas has the five ways um for god's existence and 
In the five ways, Thomas sets out, you know, different ways in which God's existence can be proven. Uh, and he, he uses that term or it's equivalent in Latin, you know, that we can prove God's existence. And he does think there can be a scientific demonstration um, of that. And um, I've written on each of the five ways. And, you know, all my writings on the five ways have actually come together in my new book and the collected articles. Um, but the third way, you know, is funnily enough, the third one that comes along the first way um, springboards from motion, a consideration of the metaphysics of motion. And from that arrives that, you know, a, a prime mover, which is a pure actuality um, from which all things come to be. Second way begins with causality, looks at the metaphysics of causality. But the third way <clears throat> looks, uh, the, the, the third way if, is drawn from um, possibility. So, uh he, he, he's considering the metaphysics of possibility, the metaphysics of modality um, in the third way. And on a basis of the consideration of those metaphysics, he generates an argument to the existence of uh, a, a primary cause of necessity for everything else, which is absolute per se mm. uh, necessary. That That's what the third way is doing. And I mean, we're going to get into the weeds of it sure, in sure. this discussion. But the general overview is that the springboard is from the metaphysics of modality, the metaphysics of possibility. Mm -hmm. Would you say that it, it's all, would it say it, it's it's a fair comparison to compare Aquinas' argument to maybe contemporary versions of uh, contingency arguments mm -hmm. or that sort of thing? Or, or is that, that that's sort of a, anachronistic? No, I wouldn't. No. Um, so <clears throat> there's um, modern accounts of modality uh, in which the basic modal notions are between necessity and contingency. And... Um, what is contingent is what e is what is able not to be, and what is necessary is what is not able not to be. Mm. Um, so the only necessary being in uh, modern uh, sort of cosmological contingency arguments is God, uh, and anything, everything other than God is a contingent being, and. Uh, th this comes about after Leibniz, right. uh, for whom, you know, uh, modality is analyzed in terms of the, the law of non-contradiction. And so once uh, the law of non-contradiction is in place, you know, able to be and not to be, you know, to um, uh, describe contingency, not able not to be, you know, uh, for necessity. Uh, we get these modern contingency arguments, but that's not what Thomas is about. And Thomas was actually familiar with this um, notion of modality from Avicenna. Uh, because for Avicenna, anything which is able not to be um, is contingent. And so basically everything other than God is contingent. And God is, you know, in Avicenna's metaphysics, absolute necessity. And Thomas actually rejects that account of um, contingency and necessity. Because um, following a very ways, um, Thomas holds that um, there are certain things which are able not to be, but which are necessary beings. And so he analyzes contingency and necessity in terms of being generated and corrupted. Mm. Okay. Things which are generated and corrupted, they're contingent things. Mm. But things which are ungenerated and do not corrupt, they're necessary things. But here's the kick. There are some things which are ungenerated and do and, and cannot corrupt, which can come into being and cease to be. Mm. Okay. So things which are generated and corrupted are uh, and corrupted are things which comes to be through the transformation of matter. Right. Okay. Once matter takes on a new form, something new is generated. And once it loses its form, um, it's corrupted. But uh, first of all, what about things which are immaterial and yet creatures mm. and, and yet created? Um, the obvious example being something like angels right. here. So angels are without matter. So they don't come to be through the formation of, in matter and they don't corrupt through matter losing its form but yet they're created directly they, they have an active existence from god mm. so they're necessary because they're not generated and corrupted and yet they're still creatures so they're not contingent <clears throat> the human soul is another example because the human soul is an immaterial form in forming a material body it's directly infused by god uh, at the at the moment of conception, so the existence of the immaterial, the existence in which the immaterial soul participates uh, and through which the body has its actuality, is not something that comes to be through transformation of matter, mm -hmm. through generation and corruption. So there you have another necessary reality, uh, which is other than God and not contingent. And then uh, on medieval physics, there are some things which exist in matter which don't come to be through the transformation of matter. And the uh, the medievals thought that the, the planetary bodies were like this, 
that they were fully actualized, their form so fully actualized their matter um, that uh, they couldn't be generated from any other matter. So they were simply granted um, existence in the beginning. And the only change that occurs is uh, locomotion. Uh, and I mean, just as an aside, we would tend to, you know, sort of dismiss that though, because quaint medieval physics, but think about elements. Think about how we think about the elements. Things come to be through the combination of elements, but how do elements come to be? You know, okay, now, I mean, there's an ongoing, you know, physical explanation of how elements come to be, but for a while, I mean, we're thinking that, you know, elements are the basic thing. Uh, the, the smallest measurement of the element is the mm -hmm. atom. Um, and that that doesn't come to be through the transformation of matter, but transformations of matter come through it. Right. And so, I mean, that is, I say, a recent scientific development, the last few hundred years. Um, so, I mean, and, and, and that seems to, you know, fit what the medievals thought about the planetary bodies, that um, they're so fully actualized that they don't come to be through transformations of matter. Um so I mean that that's just a that's just a segue that you know this this medieval speculation about you know the complete actuality of matter by the form is not as quaint and dismissive as one might want to say because the same sort of speculation is occurring uh, in in modern physics as well. But so Thomas has this alternative view of uh, modality such that um, <clears throat> you have contingent things which are generated and corrupted. Uh, you have God who's absolutely necessary, mm. but then you have this funny middle category of things which are necessary, but they're not absolutely necessary mm. because they're still able to be and not to be. So they're necessary and yet created. And this is going to explain sort of there's a twofold sort of process in the third way. First, Thomas's first task is to show that there is something that exists which is necessary. Okay, that's his first task mm. to show that there's something that exists which is necessary. And then after that, he needs to show that there's something that exists which is absolutely necessary. Mm. So showing that there's something necessary, we still haven't got that God exists. Mm. What we need to show is that the thing that exists that is necessary is not one of those created necessary things, that there's something absolutely necessary uncreated from which everything comes to be. And so that's why there's a two-stage approach in the third way. And a lot of people who are not specialists get that wrong. They just get... Um, to the proof of something which is necessary and it's like well obviously we're here at God and it's like you've missed an entire portion of the argument there Thomas doesn't stop right. there uh, and I think that's because the, there's generally a lot of a lack of knowledge about Thomas's uh, modal theory right. uh, when entering into this so so it's important to set that context no that definitely makes sense and it's also important to see in what way the third way is is parasitic upon some of Aquinas's other metaphysical commitments, mm. like the metaphysics of of, of, of essay, of, mm. of yeah. a pair alley yeah. distinction of necessary through mm. another. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we'll get to that in the second point of the argument. Every argument that Aquinas offers for the existence of God is parasitic on his more general metaphysics. Okay. You cannot do Aquinas's arguments for God unless you do his metaphysics. He does not go into these arguments neutral. And he doesn't just go in, let's let's get an argument for God's existence. He's doing metaphysics. And then he gets to a certain point in metaphysics where he's led naturally to consider whether there's a first principle mm. of all things. So, I mean, for the benefit of the listeners, you just cannot do Aquinas' proofs of God without doing the metaphysics, unfortunately, because it means that you have to wade through the metaphysics. But that's OK. Right. Uh, it just means you've got a better grasp of the argument. Then. Yeah, true, true. All right, then I figured before maybe we discuss some of the, the linguistic uh, controversies and mm. issues, maybe we could just read out the uh, the, the yeah. argument for, for a possibility. Yeah, I, I've got it here uh, in front of me. So <clears throat> this translation um, that um, I gave, uh, it's my own translation, but it's it's very close to the, the standard English translations, you know, and it's, it's hard to kind of um, sort of drift too far. So the third way, it goes as follows. We find in things some which are able to be and not to be. Since they are found to be generated and corrupted, generated and corrupted, and so are able to be and not to be. It is impossible that all things are like this, because what is able not to be at some time is not. If therefore all things are able not to be, at some time there was nothing. But if this is true, then even now there would be nothing because what is does not begin to be except through something that is. If therefore there was nothing, it would be impossible for anything to come into being, and thus there would be nothing, which is patently false. Not all things therefore are possible, but there has to exist something that is necessary. 
whatever whatever is necessary either has a cause of its necessity from another or it does not it is not possible to proceed to infinity and necessary things which have a cause of their necessity just as with efficient causes as has been proved he's referring back to the second way there therefore it is necessary to posit something that is necessary per se which does not have a cause of necessity from another but which is the cause of necessity for all others which all call god and that's the, the third way. You can get another version of that argument in um, Summa Contra Gentiles, book one, uh, chapter 15. Uh, and there's all sorts of, you know, sort of uh, studies into the, the, the historical um, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the historical background, you know, who, who were his influences in devising this argument. But that's the third way. That's the basic text of the third way, which mm. I take it we're about to dive into and analyze. Yes, very much so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So well, right off the bat, I mean, one of the, the translation that you provided is mm-hmm. is based off of, of uh, one text among uh, mm-hmm. uh, several manuscript variants, and as yeah. I understand it, uh, there, there are sort of two uh, dominant mm-hmm. textual variants. One's mm-hmm. the uh, the Leonine Summa variant, and the other's the uh, is it the Marietti edition? Yeah, the Marietti. Yeah. So um, it was uh, quite well known. Um, so Pope Leo the Thirteenth asks you know the dominicans to produce the critical works of aquinas and they just get on to this um but they quickly bring out the summa and the summa the leonine edition of the summa was recognized to be a poor um edition and you know marietti improved upon it and in the leonine edition <clears throat> the second sentence of the leonine edition the latin reads as follows um impossibile es autem omnia quae sunt talia semper esse so in the edition that i read out the second sentence reads Impossibile es autem omnia quae sunt, talia esse, quae qua possibile es non esse, quando quae non est. And basically, the way that translates is that it is impossible that all things are like this, i.e. that all things are possibilia, mm. things that are able not to be, because what is able not to be at some time is not. But the Leonine, in, the Leonine puts in um, a semper before the esse, and it reads then to say, uh, it is possible then that all things uh, that all things that are like this uh, always are always such uh, because what is possible not to be at some time is not. So what the Leonine puts in is that the po- it, it, it's impossible for the possibilia always to mm. exist, right? Uh, because what is possible at some time is not. So the Leonine actually, in including the, it's not possible for them to be always like this is looking to the future that at some point um possibilia will cease to be things which are possible will cease to be at some point in the future whereas the mariati edition reads it is impossible that all things are like this I, it is impossible that all things are possibilia mm. um because what is able not to be at some time is not and that's a key argumentative move that he's making in the mariati edition because if he's going to argue that's impossible that all things are possibilia well, the next stage is to show there's something which is necessary. Whereas the Leonine putting in the semper just doesn't make any sense. Right. Because on the Leonine reading, Thomas reasons from the fact that possibility cannot always be to the need for some necessary being. Whereas on the Mariati reason, Thomas simply makes an observation that not all things are possibility. Right. It seems that with the <clears throat> Leonine edition, they're introducing a, a principle that Aquinas never uses in no. any of his works. And No. It's never to be found in any, you know, other of Aquinas' works, mm. because um, it's certainly possible that something which is a possibilia, uh, you know, something which is contingent, mm. um, could exist forever, right, and could be preserved in existence forever, right. So it doesn't have at some point not to be, even though it's metaphysically possible for it not to be. And as I understand it, this is this is a, a dispute that Aquinas dealt with about the eternity of the world. Mm. That theoretically, yeah. even though that uh, you know, de fide, we know that 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 it had a. a, a a beginning mm-hmm. it was theoretically possible for the universe to have always temporally existed yeah absolutely so if you think of something like the 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 sun and the moon this is an example that i like to use imagine the sun and the moon never had a beginning right so the illumination of the sun of, of the moon by the sun never had a beginning so the moon's illumination never began to be yet the moon's illumination is still caused by the sun so you can have causal dependency without beginning mm-hmm. so there's still a need for causal dependency without beginning. And that's key to understanding Aquinas' thought on the eternity of the world, that even if the universe is without a beginning, it doesn't exist of itself in the same way that the moon is not illuminated of itself. It depends on another 
for its existence in the same way that the moon depends on, say, the light of the sun uh, for its existence. So, yeah, absolutely. This principle that the Leonine edition includes in the manuscripts um, or includes uh, in its version just isn't to be found anywhere else in the thought of Aquinas. And I'm not a polyographer, but I'm led to believe that the manuscript edition um, uh, just doesn't bear witness mm. to it, that the Marietta edition is more faithful to the manuscripts. But I'm not a polyographer, so I can't speak to, to sure. that authoritatively. Sure, yeah. sure. <clears throat> and then another um, slight difficulty with the argument is the use of temporal language that's mm. employed in the argument. Yeah. I mean, mm. if, if you look at the Latin, the, the, the terms that Aquinas mm -hmm. uses, quando, que, ali, quando, it, it translates to at some given time, but mm. usually when those terms are used, it's it, it's supposed to be indicative of like a past tense mm -hmm. uh, event. So yeah. how are we supposed to understand this argument then <laughs> with respect to mm -hmm. temporal? Yeah. How, how do we understand it? Yeah. So, I mean, this relates to the whole uh, composition fallacy, which is brought up at the beginning and how one understands that temporal um, language there. So maybe if we could get into the composition fallacy and then that'll address. No, uh, no, that, that definitely makes sense. I mean, as I understand it, I mean, a lot of people, when they read uh, this, the, the, the third way, they sort of bring the charge that it very easily uh, falls under mm -hmm. committing the, the, the fallacy of, of composition, even people mm -hmm. who are very sympathetic to yeah. Thomas, like, like uh, John Whipple, for yeah. instance. Yeah, yeah. I mean, John Whipple does think that, you know, Thomas has just, you know, messed up the quantifiers here, something that he doesn't do in the Contra Gentiles version. Um, <clears throat> uh, be that as it may, um, maybe, maybe we'll just look at where the shift fallacy seems to occur mm. and then um, we'll address the, you know, the different ways of reading this and, and that's going to bring in our temporal language. Okay. So um, we'll just go back to the text. Uh, and Thomas says, it is impossible that all things are like this, i.e. possibilia, contingent things. It is possible that all things are like this because what is able not to be at some time is not. So what is able not to be at some time, quando que, is not. If there all things are able not to be, at some time there was nothing. Ali quando, at some time there was nothing. So he, so he makes a statement about particular things, okay? What is possibilia, okay, is able not to be at some time? And that's a statement about particular things. But then he moves on to make a statement about all particular things, that if everything was like this, then at some time there was nothing. And this is known as the composition fallacy. You move from a statement about an individual to a statement about a composite of those individuals. So just because every man has a mother, it doesn't mean there is a mother for all men. Mm. Okay, that, that that's a typical example of a composition fallacy. I think it's Bertrand Russell's one. In, in Coppleston, I think mm. that's, the, that's the example that he gave. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that that's a fairly intuitive one. Now, here's a point um, that uh, my buddy Pat Flynn has brought up, and I think Peter Geach brings this up as well. The, the composition fallacy is not a universal fallacy. Right. Um, so, I mean, just because every man has a mother doesn't mean there's a mother for all men. True. That is a that is legitimate, valid uh, application of a composition fallacy. Right. But if every brick in the wall is red, mm. is the wall red? Yes. I mean, obviously. Yeah. So, I mean, there are times when the composition fallacy applies and times when it doesn't apply. How do we know when it does and doesn't apply? By exploring the metaphysics of the matter. Mm. Okay. Now we know that every brick in the wall being red, the wall is red, is because when you put all those bricks together, you just have one red facade. Um, and, and that's just an analysis of the metaphysics. But we know that there isn't a mother for all men because mothers, a, a mother is the mother of an individual man right. to whom she gives birth. Again, the metaphysics of the matter. So in order to tease this out, as we said, uh, to figure out um, Thomas's reasoning for, with regard to the existence of God, we need to do the metaphysics. Right. We need to see what the metaphysics is saying. And this is where we get into, you know, the different temporal um, reasoning, and you know, different temporal language, quando, que, ali, quando. Um, how do we interpret that? <clears throat> so there are three different ways um, of taking, of reading, uh, you know, this argument, you know, the quando que, you know, at some time it was not. So just back to the uh, back to the to the wording here. It's impossible that all things are like this because what is able not to be at some time is not. If there are all things are able not to be at some time, there was nothing. So what is that at some time there was nothing? At some time there was nothing. Well, the three ways of taking it is that straightforwardly it could be referring to past time. 
whatever is possible at some time is not, in which case, if all things are possible, there was a time in the past at which there was nothing. That's mm. the most obvious reading of it. Right. The other reading is referring to future time. And the, the, the Leonine reading with the Semper seems to suggest this, that if everything is possibilia, at some, you know, they, they, they can't always be like that. Right. So the, the other reading is that it, the Aliquando is referring to future time. Whatever is possible at some time is not, in which case, if all things are possible, there will be a time when there will be nothing in existence. Mm. And then the third way of reading it, and it, it kind of traces back to the first way, looking at past time, is the tenseless way. Whatever is possible at some point is not, in which case, if all things are like that, um, there would be nothing unless there's something not merely possible, right. but necessary. So the aliquando, the some other time, is that it is basically stipulating a metaphysical condition that if all things were like that, it would be such that there would be nothing, you right. know, um, th there would be a point that there would be nothing unless, you know, you had something necessary. Right. So it, it, it's talking about imaginative, figurative time. Uh, and there are the three different readings. Now, the first reading, <clears throat> the past tense one, um, it seems to have a lot in its favor. Okay, re re really seems to, to have a lot in its favor. Sure. Um, because uh, just reading the Latin, Aquinas says, quod possibile es non esse, what is possible not to be, quando que non esse, at some point is not. Si egitur omnia sunt possibile non esse, if therefore um, everything were possible not to be, mm. ali quando, at some point, nihil fuit, there was nothing in existence. Right. So fuit, you know, is referring to past time. So, mm. Given that Fawit is in the argumentation, it would seem that the time that the Aliquando is referring to is past time. Right. So that if everything was pass possibilia, trace it back, trace it back, trace it back, unless there's something necessary, these possibilia just wouldn't be. Mm. Now, I think that straight up falls into the composition fallacy right. if we read it that way. And another problem with that is it seems uh, to go against the grain of the majority of Aquinas's causal arguments yeah. is that it, they're not reliant upon temporal frequency or things like exactly. that. Exactly, exactly. Um, so the reason why I think that falls into the composition fallacy is that Thomas is just, you know, tracing back possibilia to possibilia to possibilia. So each individual is possible not to be, but, uh, you know, we can't, you know, attribute um, the possibility not to be of that chain as a whole. Mm. Uh, and, and the composition fallacy would say, well, look, unless there's something necessary to account for that chain as a whole, the chain just wouldn't exist. Right. But that's just straight up composition fallacy. That's like saying there's a mother for all men because mm. every man has a mother. Um, so I think that falls into the composition fallacy. Now, Whipple reads it in the past tense sense, mm. uh, in which case, you know, he does, he does make grant the, the, the composition fallacy to it. Um, also, you point out it goes against the green of um, Aquinas' uh, metaphysical um, thinking, that he's not just tracing back temporal frequency right, in right. causal series. But also, see if Thomas actually thought, if that's what Thomas was actually doing there, that um, we can trace possibilia back until something necessary, we would have a beginning of creation. Exactly. We would have established a beginning of creation. And what is the one thing Thomas denies throughout his career that we can do? We can't prove a beginning of creation exactly. with any sort of philosophical satisfaction. Throughout his career, he never diverged from that at one point. Right. He always held you can never prove, you cannot prove philosophically that there's a beginning to creation. Right. Now, the reason being is that that's an article of faith. Right. Uh, and as he says in several places, look, we don't want to give weak arguments for something which is an article of faith. Right. Um, <clears throat> so given that Aquinas doesn't think that, you know, uh, we can demonstrate the beginning of creation, given that, you know, this just isn't the way he reasons elsewhere and given that he's a first class honors student he's not going to make the you know it's unlikely he's going to make the conversation fallacy right, right. when elsewhere do given the same argument he doesn't right. make that fallacy we would we should maybe consider that maybe that past tense reading of that stage of the argument is the incorrect reading right it's not what thomas had intended charity would suggest that given that they're alternative readings uh, which don't fall into these problems. Right. So we look at the alternative versions. Yes. So there's the future tense reading. And um, it, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, that's the one that Anthony Kenny. Anthony prefers. Kenny, you know, prefers this one. And I wonder if I'm going to agree with Anthony Kenny here. Mm, I wonder. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a difficult thing to do. So, <clears throat> um, so the future tense reading is that 
what Thomas is arguing here, let me just get back to it, yeah, is that whatever is possible at some time is not, in which case if all things are possible, there will be a time when there will be nothing. Well, how does that work? Well, we need to work in an, assu an assumption here. If we're committed to the infinity of past time, right? Let's say we're committed to the infinity of past time. Mm. Then if everything in the past were possibilia, at some point in that infinite past time, those possibilia would have ceased to be. Mm. Because, you know, within an infinity, all kind of, you know, um, options are exhausted. Right. right. So if, you know, we assume an infinite past time, uh, and Thomas is reasoning, you know, uh, if all things are possibilia, at some point they will be nothing, then within that infinite past time, at some point those possibilia would have ceased to be. But they haven't ceased to be, in which case not everything is possibilia. Something is necessary. Now, <clears throat> um, the reason why I reject this reading, so Kenny adopts this reading, um, and maybe I'll just read you, you know, Kenny's endorsement of this. Sure. So this is from Kenny. Let me see. Uh, uh, this is from Kenny's book. Um, oh, no, sorry. This this isn't from Kenny's book. This is from Brown, uh, Patterson Brown, uh, St. Thomas's Doctrine of Necessity. He says, um, if past time be infinite, then this day of universal decay and death would already have arrived. Um, for in an infinite amount of time, all the individual processes of corruption would have been completed. Now, if indeed this had never come to pass in the history of the world, namely that nothing at all existed, then there would still be nothing in being at the present time. Hmm. Uh, things cannot just have to be begun to exist again without some cause, so that there can have been no fresh beginning, as it were. We must therefore conclude that our earlier premise was wrong. There do not exist only inherently deteriorating contingent beings, possibly. Mm. There must, in fact, exist some being or beings which, by their nature, do not progress towards non-existence. That kind of argumentation, that sort of reasoning, I think the historical source for that way of thinking is in Moses Maimonides and the Guide for the Perplexed. Mm. Um, it, it, yeah. If I remember, if I understand it correctly, it's sort of like a, a monkeys and a typewriter argument. Mm -hmm. We're given en enough time, mm -hmm. all the the everything will be corrupted, and then nothing mm -hmm. would exist. And if that's the case, even now, nothing mm -hmm. would exist. Is, is am I understanding that correctly? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> no. Well, I mean, what issue do I have with that? Well, first of all, it depends on the Leonine mm -hmm. uh, reading. Semper, yeah. Yeah. That that the Semper is there, which seems to commit Thomas to a principle that he never adopts right. anywhere else. The second is that it deploys the assumption of an infinity of past time, which the argument doesn't deploy. Mm. No mention of that is made in the argument. Right. You need to you need to bring that assumption in to make the argument work. But if you need to bring in an assumption to make one of Aquinas' arguments work, an assumption that Aquinas doesn't endorse, then you're obviously not reading Aquinas' argument properly. Right. So I don't think this is a proper reading of the argument because because of those issues right. that you're having to bring in principles that Thomas just doesn't adopt right. in order to make it work. Well, maybe either say that it just doesn't work or maybe, you know, have a look at it again and see if it works on a different reading. Right. And so this brings us to the third one, the final reading of the argument. And and, and this is the one um, that I prefer. And this is the tenseless reading. Joseph Owen sort of has a version of this. He thinks that, you know, that, that we start talking about, we're talking about tensed time, but then we go on to talk about, you know, metaphysical conditions. That okay. When we say aliquando, we're talking about at some point, you know, there is some metaphysical sort of stage of being that if everything were possibilia um, without some, you know, necessary hook to hang on, nothing would be. Uh, and so this is the reading that I prefer. So the tenseless one is that when Aquinas is talking about uh, the aliquando, the, the some point uh, at, at which um, uh, there would be nothing, He's just talking about the fact that without some necessary being, possibly just hang in the air. Mm. So if you think um, uh, of uh, things which have some sort of causal actuality, mm -hmm. non-essentially, like, uh, you know, the hand, which moves the stick to move the stone, right, right. they have motion non-essentially. But unless you have some primary cause, which has that, you know, power to move essentially, the mm. mind... The motion in the hand, stick, and stone is just hanging there. Right. You know, there's nothing which causes that causality. So um, without anything to cause that causality, there just wouldn't be any causality in that series. Well, I see Thomas is making the same point here, that if everything was just possibilia, 
It would be like the hand stick and the stone possessing motion without any source from which to possess it. Okay, without any hook on which to hang that motion. Right. So if all things were possibilia, okay, without a necessary hook to hang that motion, those possibilia would just be nothing. Right. Okay. They would have nothing to ground uh, their reality as possibilia. Mm. So the aliquando at some point there would have been nothing is pointing to the fact that without, you know, some necessary being, these things would just be nothing. Okay. Uh, so that's how I read it, the, the, these terms in a tenseless sense. Right. And, and in, in fairness, it does seem as though we're stretching the meaning of the Latin, mm. but I think that's just indicative mm. of philosophy in general more than, than anything else. What, what, yeah. what do you say? I mean, you know, we are just, you know, stretching, you know, the meaning of good old Latin words like quando que and aliquando. But look, um, first of all, like take something like talking about creation and the beginning of creation. Mm. I mean, St. Augustine Confessions, Book 11, talks about, you know, a beginning of creation and, you know, what's prior to the beginning. Right. Uh, and immediately you're met with the Aristotelian objection. Well, if there's a prior to the beginning, then it's not really a beginning. Right, right. And Augustine's like, oh, come on. We can use the term prior in different ways. We can talk about logically prior, analytically prior, right. temporally prior. Right. right. Okay. So we can use these temporal notions in an analogical sense. We and, and, and language is flexible enough to do that. I mean, we have logical, analytical, and temporal. Right. priority each meaning different things and you I mean you just go through uh, augustine's analysis of priority in confessions book 11 right right uh, and thomas you know grants that thomas talks about creation and talks about you know a prior to creation and he's he's not talking about you know a temporal priority he's talking about a state of affairs um which uh, signifies the metaphysical conditions for creation mm. they are of the metaphysical conditions for creation are obviously prior to creation insofar as they ground creation but it's an analytical priority. Without these conditions in place, you wouldn't have creatures. Right. But it doesn't mean that they're temporally prior to creatures. It means that they ground the reality of creatures. So we can use that sort of temporal language. And I did a search of the Index Fomisticus mm -hmm. for terms like uh, ando que, uh, quando and quando que. Do a search of the Index Fomisticus for these terms, and you will notice uh, so many instances where Thomas uses these in a non-literal okay. sense. Um, so, so clearly, you know, just doing philosophy we do have to use ordinary language um in non-ordinary ways right that's what we're working with mm. you know so god bless Wittgenstein. you know uh that you know um ordinary language it may be the first word it may have the first word in philosophical analysis but it doesn't have the last word okay right it's right. certainly the first word yes do begin with ordinary language and tidy that up but it certainly doesn't have the last word right they're real philosophical problems here and we need to stretch our language to deal with them so i think we are justified in reading quando que and ali quando um, <clears throat> as signifying the metaphysical conditions without which there wouldn't be possibilia. I see. And the metaphysical conditions without which there wouldn't be possibilia is just like the hand stick and the stone possessing motion. Unless there's something which isn't like the hand stick and the stone, i.e. the mind, mm. which has motion of itself, they wouldn't have motion. So in the same way, unless there is something which isn't a possibilia, mm -hmm. one of those possibilia, you wouldn't have possibilia. But what is it that isn't possibilia? It's something which is necessary. Yes. So at that point in the argument, then, we've got to the point that there must be not something necessary right. uh, without which there wouldn't be the possibilia. Right, but Aquinas doesn't go from, make the jump from, we have a necessary being to this yeah. is everything yeah. call, everyone calls God. But yeah. There's still, still some more finessing that, yeah. that, that he needs to make. Yeah, because it's not a contingency argument. <clears throat> it's, it's not a contingency argument like you get in a post-like Nietzschean world whereby once you've got a necessary being you've got um, something that's impossible not to be so for Thomas things which are necessary either have their necessity per se okay so they have necessity essentially so they're absolutely mm. necessary mm. or they have their necessity from another so angels for example okay are directly created by God they're not generated they don't corrupt so they're created as necessary beings the human soul is created as a necessary being. Mm. Well, a component of a being. Um, it's a, so it, it's it's a component which is necessary and it's of a composite substance. Um, and then on medieval physics, the planetary bodies are like that as well. So these things are given their necessity from another. Mm. Uh, I, I mean, this is Thomas's view of necessity that you know um, God can create things as necessary. Mm. So they get their necessity from God. So they don't have it per se. 
they have it per allute. Right. And look at this. We have things which have some sort of causal feature, necessity, per allute. Now, remember, no necessary being, no possibilia, mm. right? Possibilia, necessary being. Right. So we've got the possibilia hooking on to the necessary, right? right? So now we have things which are necessary, which have their necessity through another. Mm. Now, um, the, the listeners might remember previous podcasts, but um, Thomas has committed to the principle that what is per allure through another is reducible to what is per se. This is Thomas's reasoning of essentially ordered series. The hand, the stick, and the stone have their motion per allure mm. through another. Uh, so uh, where do they derive it? They don't derive it from another per allure, uh, because that doesn't cause the causality. It presupposes the causality. Right. They derive it from something which can cause the causality, i.e. something which has the motion or the power of moving per se, right. which is the mind. Replace the motion with necessity. Okay? okay, You have per allure necessary beings. Where do they derive their necessity? Well, it can't be from something which is itself per allure, because that doesn't cause necessity, Okay, because mm. it doesn't have necessity of itself, so it can't cause the necessity. So they derive it from something which is per se necessary. Okay. So you got the possibilia hanging on to the necessary, and the necessary aren't the causes of their own necessity, so they're, they're caused in their necessity by something which is per se necessary. So everything is hanging on the hook of what is per se necessary or absolutely necessary. And if everything is hanging on that hook, all the possibilia, all the paralyses necessary, mm. well, that's everything. Right. All things are either possibilia or paralyot necessary. Well, they all hang on the hook of what's per se necessary. Well, that's God. Mm. So, and that's where the argument ends there, at that which is absolutely necessary. I see. Okay. That de that definitely makes sense. All right. Then I think I think that that covers uh, what I wanted to talk about with, with with the third way. But if it's all right, I, I was hoping to ask a few questions about uh, Aquinas's more modal uh, metaphysical mm -hmm. commitments. If that's all right. Yeah. Well, I'll try my best. I haven't looked at that stuff sure. in a good while. But okay. yeah. As I understand it, um, Aquinas will sometimes talk about uh, an absolute necessity versus an, um, a suppositional uh, necessity. Mm -hmm. Would this play at all into? The metaphysics of of creation because Aquinas is going to want to you know he's a Catholic theologian who's going to want to say that everything I uh, uh, absolutely considered could have mm -hmm. failed to obtain their their their, mm -hmm. their essay and essence are, are, are two distinct principles yeah. that, that that's just yeah. the fact of the matter but th th there's still a sort of suppositional ne necessity mm -hmm. where you cannot admit that they exist at, at the same time and they don't exist at the same mm -hmm. time because yeah. they be contradictory yeah. states of affairs. Yeah. So, I mean, that absolute versus suppositional necessity in God, God is absolutely necessitated to will his divine essence mm. as the good. Right. Okay. He can't help but will his divine essence. In other words, he can't help but love himself. Mm. That's, I mean, when you put it that way, he can't help but do that. It sounds like he's weak. You know, if only he could hate himself. You know? But obviously that's not what, it, it, it just means given that what God is, he is his will is drawn to love himself as the good itself. Mm -hmm. Now, so absolute and suppositional necessity. Um, God is um, absolutely constrained to will the goodness of the divine essence, to love the divine essence. That is the object, the proper object of his will, uh, and he loves himself by necessity. Mm -hmm. Now, he, he could do that for all eternity and you know, there'd be no creatures and that would be fine. Mm. There are creatures. So on the supposition that God wants there to be creatures, creatures will be. Mm. And that's the suppositional necessity. If God wants something to happen on the supposition that he wants it to happen, creatures will be. Mm. And God wills the existence of creatures as um, a means of willing his divine essence. Mm. In other words, he wills creatures to exist as manifestations of the goodness of the divine essence. So every creature is good precisely because it's a manifestation of the divine essence. And God loves it that way because he loves himself. So there's nothing that any creature could do to cause God to stop loving it because he loves creatures as a manifestation of his divine essence. So creation is entirely gratuitous. Mm. It's a gratuitous act of love from God. So that's the uh, the suppositional or conditional necessity and the absolute necessity. And then there's a ton of stuff we can get into that. I mean, there's this whole notion of an act of will and, mm. you know... Um, because immediately when people think of willing, they just think you come up with this wee notion in your mind, mm -hmm. that notion moves down into your 
bones, your fingers and toes, right. and then you act. Right. And that's obviously not what happens whenever you will, because if you will something, it can't be the case that something happens in your head and whatever happens in your head causes you to act because then you're not the one acting. Right. Something in your head is causing you to act and you're being controlled as a puppet by this intention, this act of will in your head. So that's obviously not what happens when willing. Mm. When we will something, we see an end and we just pursue it. Mm. That's all we do. We see an end uh, and we pursue it. Now, if it comes to be that there are competing ends, then we do have to sit and discern which end would be better. Okay, And that's usually due to a lack of knowledge on our part. We don't know what the better end would be here. Would it be better for me to do a powerlifting workout or a more sort of cardio conditioning workout? Would it be better for me to follow this diet in order to make weight for the fight rather than to follow that diet? Given so, so we have some sort of end in sight and we know we want to pursue that, but given my lack of knowledge, I have to think that through. Mm. Well, God doesn't have a lack of knowledge. Right. God knows exactly, you know, God knows exactly what end he wants to pursue and pursues it. He doesn't form a little intention in the divine mind and then that causes him to work. Right. He just gets up and goes, a basic action. Mm. And what changes is not God, but the effect is something that changes. Some sort of effect is brought about. But mm. God doesn't change because acts of willing are not something that occurs in the, that occur in the head. Unfortunately, you know, modern philosophy, you know, situates knowing willing in the head, okay. not something outside of the mind. Right, right. Okay, the extended mind notion. And, and modern philosophy has really got us thinking in an internalistic sort of way about these things. And you know, it, it took Kant and the German idealists to help us overcome. Right. Uh, the, this sort of way of thinking. So so that's a whole can of worms that can be opened on intentional action and agency. Uh, and so obviously there's going to be an account of agency and an endorsement of basic action uh, in order to say that God can will these things without himself forming right. this act of will in himself. Right, <clears throat> right. And so God still remains God and unchanging, mm. but it, it, well, what undergoes change, or creation, I should say, would be creation. The things that are created. Yeah, and that's what Thomas says, you know, creation isn't anything in God. Creation is something in the creature mm. uh, because creation is the possession of an active existence by the creature. Um, that, that's all creation is. So, I mean, Thomas is very clear on that. And then he has his whole account of intentional action, you know, which Anscombe, you know, uh, appropriates against Donald Davison, who holds that alternative view that right. you form it in the mind and that causes you to act. Right, right. Yeah. It was a very interesting mm. story that what caused Anscombe uh, mm. to, to to write the book Intention. I think it was originally Intention. Maybe it was, it was an article about mm. Intention. As I understand it, uh, it had to do with, with American politics mm-hmm. and uh, Truman dropping uh, the, 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 the atom bomb yeah. uh, over yeah. uh, Hiroshima. And mm-hmm. I believe it was, what was it, at Oxford or Cambridge that, that, that a lot of the, these dons wanted to give them <laughs> They wanted to give uh, Truman an honorary degree for doing that. Yeah, yeah. Anscombe was just scandalized. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure it was so much they wanted to give him an honorary degree for dropping the bomb. Okay. But I think it was more for, you know, leading the nation, you okay. know, through at the end of World War II okay. Okay. and all of that. But yeah, Anscombe, you know, uh, when Truman dropped the bomb, Anscombe thought that this was a morally objectionable thing to do. Hmm. And I know opinions are divided on whether or not it was morally objectionable. Um but her opponents didn't really sort of, you know, challenge her on whether or not it was morally objectionable, you know, the sort of thing. Well, look, dropping the bomb ended the war. What else could he have done? They said, well, he didn't really do it. He just pushed the button. He just gave the order. That's where his responsibility stopped, let's say, pushing the button. Mm. And then it was those who further down the line dropped the bomb. They're responsible. And Anscombe just thought, well, no, he saw a goal, right? And in pushing the button, he's striving to bring about this goal that he sees as choice worthy. Uh, and, you know, her opponents thought, well, no, that's not how agency works. Right. Agency stops with the first immediate action you produce. So she undertook to do a whole uh, analysis of the psychology of action. And this was the lectures on intention, mm. uh, which became the book Intention, which is one of the most difficult books I've ever read in philosophy. Mm. Really, really is. But one of the most rewarding once I came to understand what she was getting at, that an intention <clears throat> is not something that occurs in the mind. So Donald Davidson, he comes after Anscombe, and he incidentally said that Anscombe's work on intention was the best work on the philosophy of action since Aristotle. Um, so high regard. But Davidson sees, Davidson sees, uh, breaks down the world in terms of events, 
Okay, so it's an event account of causality. And there are some causal relations, which is just one event causing another event, but there are some causal relations, there are some events, which are actions. So what is it that distinguishes actions from events which are non-actions? It's the special ingredient called an intention. Mm. So we add in the intention. So how do we add in the intention? Well, we all have, we already have the event of say, using your finger to push the button. Right. So where does the intention comes in? Well, obviously intention is cooked up in your mind, goes down into your limbs and gets your finger to push the button. Okay. That's what's added to it. Anscombe thought, look, this is nonsense. Okay. Aside from the fact that we have this sort of internal forum of a mind, which is already mm. problematic in itself, mm. the idea that that's how intention works means that the agent isn't exercising agency. It's the intention which is exercising the agency. The agent isn't doing anything. The agent is being forced to do something by the intention uh, itself. On Anscombe's analysis, what it is, you see a goal and you take steps to produce, to um, uh, achieve that goal. The intentionality, okay, of your action is in the form of the action itself. What is it that that action is trying to bring about? Okay, what, what is it that that action is striving after? That's the intentionality of your mm -hmm. action. It has an intentional shape to it, which is always towards some sort of final cause. I, I was going to say, it, it sounds as though that an intention is always constituted by a final cause. Yeah. What we're one yeah. wants are the actions to, yeah. what, to perform. Yeah, that's got this magnetic attraction, which forms your um, action in order to achieve it. Right, right. Yeah. So Anska <clears throat> would say to Truman that, okay, you didn't just press a bomb. Like you're, you, the, What your goal was, was to bomb. You know, yeah, the, the... you saw a goal and you wanted to, you know, um, on, on our analysis, you know, so you saw a goal and you, you wanted to dro drop the atom bomb to cause as much devastation to push the Japanese leadership hand mm. to surrender. Right. Uh, which Anska took to be objectionable. Now, set aside whether or not it is morally objectionable, the, the deeper point is that it, it brought her to a deeper analysis of intentional action. Right, right. Mm. All right, then. Well, I think this has been a very good talk. We talked about a lot. We talked about the, contin uh, the I almost said contingency argument out of, <laughs> out of habit. We talked about the argument from necessity and possibility. We talked about Aquinas' uh, modal uh, metaphysics and, and mm -hmm. his uh, modal commitments. And we talked about Anscombe and intentionality. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I figured maybe as a, a closing uh, question, do you have any book recommendations for those who would want to learn more? As, as I understand it, uh, very recently, mm -hmm. uh, there's a, 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 a book was published of your collected articles on the arguments for the existence of God. Yeah. So, um, Adicionis Scholastici, um, just brought out, um, my collected articles on the existence of God over the past 10 years, which includes a couple of new articles in it as well. And, and it's got all my articles on the five ways, along with my articles on other of Aquinas' proofs, um, as well. And the really interesting way in which that it's been structured, it starts off We've given an account of uh, the metaphysics of the matter. Can we prove God's existence? What's the nature of causal series and do they terminate in primary causes? Mm. And then it goes in to the proofs proper themselves. And there's a unified reading of the five ways in each of them. I never really intended this, but as I was writing each article on the five ways, the same unified approach um, came out. Um, and then it finishes up with uh, an account of uh, how we get from God's existence to God's nature. Hi Thomas does that because mm. they're different approaches. I mean, people talk about classical theism as if it were the same for every classical theist, but classical theism, you know, spans, you know, if we go right back to Plato, right, right, you know, and we go right up to, and let, let's just say Suarez, yes, you know, you've maybe got what eighteen hundred years exactly. Uh, so I mean, and it's not like there's one unified classical theistic approach, right, right. I mean, I mean. Our classical, classical theists are committed to God's eternity, simplicity, omnipotence, omniscience, all mm. of that goodness. Mm. Mm. So um, <clears throat> they are committed to the same affirmations, but the way in which they affirm them is different for each classical theist. So in the same way that both Aquinas and Scotus are committed to the existence of God, the way in which they're committed to that, I mean, Scotus disagrees with Aquinas' arguments. Occam disagrees with both of them, and Occam's committed to the existence of God as well. Um, so it's the same with the nature of God. So, I mean, what I did in the, that final article, which uh, it's a new article and not a, a collection, is I pointed out that there's these different ways of um, making affirmations about the divine essence. Mm. There is uh, the causal route, the perfect being route, and the modal route. 
Uh, I associate the perfect being root with Anselm and the modal root with Avicenna and Aquinas is the causal root. Mm. So, you know, the perfect being root basically says, you know, we can affirm, you know, predicates of God insofar as God will always have those attributes, which is better to have than not to have. Mm. Um, the modal root derives, um, <clears throat> so this is of Avicenna, derives the divine attributes from God's absolute necessity. The causal root derives God's divine attributes from his being the primary cause. Mm. And this is Aquinas' root. The perfect being, perfect being theology is not the same as primary cause theology. And necessary being theology is not the same as either, precisely because of the way in which they justify the divine attributes. Mm. So there's three different types of classical theism right, right there. Um, and so anybody who hand waves or gestures to say, you know, the classical theists are committed to this, is like, well, which classical theists? Exactly. <laughs> You know, I mean, the, the, the classic McIntyre, whose justice, which rationality? Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, whose reasoning here? Which classical theism are we talking about? Mm. You know, don't start talking about perfect being theology and then think you've got Aquinas in your sights because you right. don't. Right. And I think that, that that's very true. I mean, a lot of um, interlocutors that, 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 that I've encountered sometimes seem to think that Aquinas sort of transmodifies predications onto God, onto God yeah. simply because he sees them as perfections, whereas yeah. really it's because of causal demonstrations that we yeah. predicate the things we predicate of God. Yeah. You know, God, God is like utterly simple, let's say, mm. because he's a primary cause. His primary cause is pure actuality. Right. Got no potency, no composition. Mm. You know, I mean, that's just a brief, you know, one. Um, whereas for Scotus, slightly different. Right. Avicenna, slightly different uh, again. And it's all these differences which produce these uh, different positions. So so the final chapter, um, so it's a new article in that book, it's just making that case that um, you can't take different classical theisms, criticize, say, one of them, or just one single representative of one of them, and think that you've got the whole 1,800 years of classical theism. Right, right. Gavin, thank you so much for being on. It was a pleasure. Yeah, it was great. Thanks very much. Hope you're happy to be on again.